Hey friends, yesterday, Sunday, we started an amazing journey on the story never told about Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. And over the next three days, that's exactly what we're gonna do. I wanna talk about the story never told. Hi, my name's Mike Scan. I am the senior pastor of Epic Life Church. And we're gonna begin our journey last week when we talked about the Seder meal. What was the Seder meal? It was the last meal Jesus had with his disciples. Matter of fact, in scripture, it talks about how Jesus was so anxious to have that meal with them. He was looking forward to that meal, knowing that it would be his last. But during that meal, Jesus looks over to one of his disciples, the disciple Judas, and he looks over at him and he tells Judas, Judas, go and do what you need to do. Judas, knowing now that the Lord knew that he was gonna be the betrayer that would betray Jesus Christ. Now, Judas gets up from the table. The disciples didn't know what was going on. He leaves. They think he was gonna go get new wine or something for the meal. But Judas ends up going to the Sanhedrin, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees for 30 pieces of silver willing to give up Jesus, but not just Jesus. He was, he was willing to give up the Passover lamb, the son of God. So Jesus, the next day on Monday, Monday evening sometime, we're not sure exactly on the time, but we know that in that evening hour, Jesus had to have felt the pressure of what was fixing to happen in his life over the next couple of days. And so on Monday evening, while in the garden, he dropped off the disciples and he moves further into the woods or the garden of Gethsemane. And during that time, in just anguish, he falls to his knees and he begins to pray. During this time of prayer, the anguish is shown. Matter of fact, it was so bad that Jesus, during that moment, bleeds drops of blood because of the pain and the agony and the weight of sin that was fixing to fall upon his shoulders. Your sin and my sin. But his last words were to the Father during that prayer was, Lord, if there be any other way, take this from me, but not my will be done, your will be done. At that moment, Refreshing and energy came back into Jesus. He stands up from prayer and he takes back off to go pick up the disciples. When he arrives back at the disciples, he shakes them up, they get up. And at that moment, Jesus declares to all the disciples around him that his betrayer is at hand. It's in that moment that Judas appears into the garden of Gethsemane with a garrison of soldiers, Roman soldiers armed to the sheep, ready to do battle if necessary. They take Judas and they push him forward, pushing him toward Jesus, wanting them to identify who is the Christ, who is this guy that calls himself the Messiah. For the first time, Judas makes eye contact with, with his Savior, with, his, with Jesus Christ. He looks at him eye to eye and he leans over and he kisses Jesus. Jesus' response to him is to back off and he looks at Judas and with probably love in his eyes, like only Jesus could have, he looks at Judas and says, Judas, with a kiss, you betray me? It's at that moment, chaos begins to explode. The Roman soldiers grab up Jesus. And from that point, they march him in to the Sanhedrin and to the Pharisees. And in Matthew 26, down in the middle around uh, the verse 40, that place that I wanna hang out for a moment, because Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, all the rulers, all the Pharisees and the Sadducees who knew the law, and that's what the Sanhedrin's job were. See, the Sanhedrin gathered around Jesus to make sure that the accusation that was being brought to, about him had enough witnesses. Matter of fact, the law said they had to have two or three witnesses in order for the charges to go through. So, of course, we know the story that the Pharisees had gathered up these false witnesses, but no proof could be held against them until a very critical moment. And that moment is when the high priest of the time, Caiaphas, he walks into the room. He walks up to Jesus and he says, you, now I command you by an oath to God that you tell me whether you are the son of God or not. Well, Jesus being Jesus was perfect. He had never lied, nor could he ever lie. Matter of fact, scripture teaches us that God is not like man that he should lie. So with all honesty, Jesus looks at Caiaphas and says to him, it is as you say it is. Caiaphas is enraged. And at that moment, he takes his curtain, his, his, his uh, holy garments that will take him into the temple in order to do the annual sacrifice of what? the perfect lamb for the nation of Israel. And he does something unheard of. In front of all of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin that are gathered around him, he rips his holy garments 
Now, if you don't understand, and if you pass right by this, here's something that could happen. You'll miss the point. You see, if you go back where the garment was made, God said that no tear or rip or anything can be out of place with these holy garments. And Caiaphas had just ripped his garments in two. The Pharisees that are gathered around him, the Sadducees that are there are looking and beholding this event, going in themselves saying, who now shall make the sacrifice in the holy temple? Because Caiaphas was the high priest. See, the high priest at the time was elected by the Roman officials because they were afraid of an uprising that might come in. Caiaphas was actually elected by the Roman Empire and not by God himself. So what do we do? Well, we need to pause on this story and, and backtrack just a little bit to a time that many of us are familiar with. It is a time where John the Immerser is standing on a hill and he's watching many of these believers come into the pool and be baptized or immersed. It's at that moment, people were asking John, the, the immerser, the baptizer, are you the one prophesied? Are you the son of God? And John said, no, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. But in a moment, we see in scripture that, G, that something happens and John looks through the crowd and who does he see? He doesn't see his cousin who he probably grew up with. No, he makes a huge declaration. And the declaration is, behold, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. It's at that moment, man, that Jesus approached John and looks at John and says, John, I need you to baptize me. And John the Immerser says, wait a minute, how in the world am I gonna baptize you? You're the son of God. And Jesus' response is so powerful today. And he says to him, you must so that all things will be fulfilled. Well, to understand this terminology, you have to look at who John the Baptist really is. You see, John the Baptist wasn't just a guy that was thrown out into the wilderness and ate grasshoppers. No, there's so much more to the story. You see, John the Baptist, his mother was Elizabeth. Elizabeth was raised and grew up and his, her lineage, her genealogy comes from the tribe of Aaron. It's where we get the Arianic priesthood. So she literally was one of the priests. She had priests in her blood. And then her father, he came from the, Levit the Levitical priesthood. You can find all of this out in Luke chapter one, beginning in verses two through four, you'll see that John the Baptist wasn't just an ordinary person. No, John the Baptist was a priest. And see, only a priest could look at a lamb and determine whether or not it was worthy of the sacrifice. And that's what John the Baptist was doing. So now we fast back forward with Jesus standing before the Sanhedrin. You have all of the Sanhedrin going, who's gonna make the sacrifice? But here's the kicker. And here's what I wanna leave you with is that standing before them was the great high priest. His name was Jesus, and he was more than just a high priest. He was the Passover lamb that would be crucified for the sins of the world. I'll see you tomorrow night.